Oh, thank you. All right, I guess my microphone wasn't on. There we go. Um, I appreciate that, especially on a Monday morning. Uh, yeah, right, 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 right. Anyhow, uh, I was I was saying, uh, coming soon is the design document for your project being due, and that is um, all the um, sections that we talked about in class and as documented, and in my example. Um, one thing I would I would suggest for you to do is. Um, and this might be a little harder for the folks that are in the online class, but um, discuss your project, show your project to other people. And again, in, in, as far as class goes, you know, show it to other folks that are in class. But even uh, you know, even your friends or whatever, you know, you can you can show that to them to get feedback and all that. It's especially nice for folks that are in class, though, or that can show it to someone that's in class. So if you know someone, maybe. That, that's also taking the class, show it. Because you can get ideas from each other and you can see how people have ad uh, addressed certain issues and you can see, you know, uh, how people have done something. Um, I, I did a real big grading binge to try to catch up uh, on the grading and I'm almost there. Uh, just, uh, I just have the most recent assignment that was due um, last week. To finish up, but I mean, when I look at it, there's some really nice web pages out there. So again, take the time to, um, you know, just ask someone, hey, can I see things that you've worked on or whatever, and and, and you know, and, and that can be helpful, and it can be helpful to get feedback going forward on your project. Um, so anyhow, I want to want to keep you focused on on the project and also talk about the benefits of, of sharing. I mean, there's a lot of reasons why it's better to take a class than to try to learn it on your own. And one of the reasons it is is because there's other people in the class that you can bounce ideas off of and see what they're doing and become inspired by, by their work. So, all right. Um, one thing I will say, um, I, I was rereading some sections of the book over the weekend. And in particular, um, they talked in chapter 9 about using classes versus using IDs. And the author of the book ta uh, uh, comes, on the, comes down mainly on the side of using classes. And he, the author gives some very good reasons why um, the preference is classes. But that being said, know that that's not like the correct answer, you know. That's the strategy that this particular author likes and, and makes, makes work, all right? You can take different approaches to styling things. You can see we have all different kinds of ways of selecting. So you could potentially write two different style sheets that didn't look at all alike, the style sheets that is, yet created the same page just by using different selectors. All right, you could use a totally different set of selectors and come up with the same look. And the author talks about using classes to do that. If you notice in most of my examples, I've been using IDs. All right. They argue that if I wanted to change, for example, like the primary color of the page, I'd have to change several IDs. And that's true. I guess, in my mind, it's more straightforward than, than having uh, multiple classes that you can assign to multiple things. Uh, I want to know, for example, that that H1 gets that style. For me, that, that's a good idea. It makes it very straightforward for me to see. And yeah, if I have to change blue to green in two places, uh, that's better than me trying to decipher um, like all the different classes. You can assign an element to two different classes, and then it will get the style of those two classes. And again, there's a potential for conflicts between them and so on. So I, I guess what I'm saying is, that consider all these different selectors and techniques and all that a, uh, you know, as tools in, in your tool belt. And you can pull them out and apply them as, as you need them and in a way that makes sense for you. Um, you probably want to try to do things fairly consistently. That is, if you take an approach, if you, if you use IDs and not classes quite as much, then, then do that throughout the project. Don't style a different section of the page a different way. Um, but anyhow, 
Um, one thing that I'm also very aware of is, again, you know, um, been doing this a while, so some of these habits are habits uh, pre-CSS3 and pre-HTML5. And uh, it's also an issue as far as browser support goes. So I think the approach I take some, uh, possibly might lend itself to a more wider browser support. But anyhow, um, it, it's good to be exposed to a variety of different methods. And you can see sort of what makes sense and works for you. And in addition, if you're working with someone else that maybe has a different style, or if you see an example online that has a different style, you won't be totally thrown by it. So I did want to mention that, um, you know, that, that to, to a degree that, that, you know, in some, how do I want to say this? In some cases, I could look at one strategy and say, that style sheet is better than that style sheet, and then give some solid reasons. But in another case, you may have two style sheets that do similar things, and they're just two different ways of doing the same thing. So I guess what I'm saying is, it's not that anything goes. It's not that like, well, do whatever you want to. But then again, it's not as though there's just one correct answer either to, to how, how to develop the styles for your page. But just know the selectors and know them real well and figure out for your particular project what's going to work best. That again is an aspect of design. All right, you know, uh, people talk about uh, design, you know, we talked about before about how people think it's choosing the fonts and the pretty colors and all that. But choosing like how you're going to apply the styles, are you going to have classes, are you going to have IDs, what sort of selectors are gonna, you're going to use. Thinking that process through and coming up with a good strategy that's going to work for you and it's going to be easy to change is part of the planning process as well. And that's part of the design. And for your uh, assignment that's due now, that part will be done as you do the design phase uh, of it and as you create the prototype. Anyhow, um, let's see also in my notes before we continue. The one suggestion they have, again, is given that the HTML is meant to be the content of the page, arrange your HTML in the order that makes sense if there was no style at all. In other words, if you're just doing a plain, simple, first day of class web page, arrange your, con arrange your content in that order and then do things to style it. All right. It's also okay to do a bit at a time. You don't have to necessarily do all your HTML than all your CSS. And in fact, you don't have to do all of anything at the same time. The way I develop web pages is very similar to the way I demonstrate in class. That is, I don't necessarily type in the entire web page, all the CSS, and then look at it for the first time. I'll do a little pieces at a time. And, you know, I'll put dummy text in, or I may not know the exact links, but I'll make, just, I'll make them links to Google or something like that. And then I go back in and add the actual real functionality. You know, you don't, you know there's no prize for getting there in one leap. You know, as long as you get to a well-designed web page, it doesn't matter if you go through a few steps to get there. Uh, in my mind, it makes it easier, a lot easier to find problems and, uh, than, than to try to do everything and have nothing work. And then, you, you know, you're, you're looking for the solution to a bunch of problems at the same time. Do one piece, get it to work, then move on to the next piece. All right. Um, what we're going to do now is we're going to look at some of the uh, ways to do layout in, in CSS. And in a nutshell, um, and I, I don't recall the exact terms they used uh, in this book for it, but in a nutshell, uh, these are fixed layouts. These are liquid layouts. And then the other term that's been used for things that are sort of between liquid and fixed is jello. Jello layouts. In other words, they move a little bit, but they're not liquid, but they're not frozen either. So the old textbook, if I remember right, called them ice, jello, and liquid. And I, I, I think that's a good, uh, good descriptive words. And um, there, there's advantages and disadvantages to both, and we'll, we'll explore these. And the first one that we're going to talk about is the simplest one, and that is a fixed layout. And a fixed layout is just as the, the name implies. Everything is going to be fixed. Everything's going to be nailed down into position. So it doesn't matter 
what how big your browser window is, it doesn't matter what device you're on, none of this matters, it's going to look a certain way. Now that has some drawbacks, right? Because if you have a little monitor, stuff is going to be overflowing off the sides. If you have a big monitor, the web page is going to be like a postage stamp in the, in the corner of the page, all right? Uh, but again, it's a good jumping off point and it, it's, good, uh, it's a good way to get started uh, in this area. So let's look at where we left off last time. Um, we were looking at this position example. I think. We must have done something towards the end of the class to break it for Firefox, but we'll go and, and we'll take a look for uh, look at that. Maybe I forgot to save the Yeah, I forgot this. Actually Yeah. I put I put the code that I need for Firefox in a separate CSS file but then I never went and changed the HTML. Yep. There we go. And this raises a good point. The time to test, there we go. The time to test your pages is not, um, at the very end. By testing, I mean cross-browser cross testing. In other words, don't do all your development in Internet Explorer or Firefox, and then at the very end, say, oh, gee, I wonder what it looks like in the other browser. All right? You, you're, you're likely to find uh, big issues uh, if you do it that way. Keep in mind that, that prior to this, browser compatibility issues have been less of an issue in this class. Some of you may have experienced some, but again, this is really where the issues sort of come out to a much greater degree. So it's important to test, it's important to test right from the start. All right. Remember, we have a couple of catches in here to handle old browsers. We have, for example, this HTML5 shiv, which allows pre-IE9, uh, pre-IE8, oh, I'm sorry, pre-IE9 to handle the HTML5 elements correctly. We also have the second style sheet that I added in today that has code in there to make sure that old versions of um, Firefox displays the page correctly. All right. So now we're going to try to position these things. And the way we can position them is we can put in, if we're doing a fixed position, we can put in the top and left coordinates of the element and it will be positioned that way. We can also do the bottom and right, but typically you use the top and left to position the elements. So what I mean is, I can go in here and say, if this is the page, I can say I want my banner to be here and I want it to be 
10 pixels from the top and 20 pixels from the left. So this point up here is like 0, 0.00. And then from there we can specify how far to the left we want to push something, how far from the top we want to push something. So let's look at our example here. So I could put the header. The header right now has a border of five pixels. It is black and solid, the border. I can say top 10 pixels, left 20 pixels, and then I can say position absolute. And when we do that, what that means is that element, that element is nailed down in that position. All right? So it's going to be 10 from the, from, the, from the top, 20 from the left. So let's save it and look at it. All right, my project, 10 from the left, 20 from the right. Now notice something happened that isn't really good. All right. This is a case, any, anything that happened before now we could say is a case of just being Monday, you know, and, and, and maybe my brain not working 100%. But this is like we knew it was going to happen, or I knew it was going to happen. What happened? Well, keep in mind that there's two ways that an element on the screen gets a position. All right? There's two ways that something on a screen gets any visual attribute. One of it is from your CSS. The other is the browser default. Now, what's the browser default? The browser default is to simply flow one element after the other, boom, 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 which the browser will happily do to all the elements on our page. All right. What we've done is we've interfered with that flow. We've said, hey, I don't want that to appear where it normally is going to appear. I want it to appear in the fixed place. So the browser puts the header in the fixed place. All right fine and good so far, but then what it does with the rest of the stuff is it says, well, okay, the rest of the stuff I'm going to put in the normal flow. So it puts the first thing other than that header on the top and then so on down the line. So one thing that we're going to find out with this is that you kind of can't really mix too much in this. In other words, if you start to take control of the layout, you're going to have to control you can't just control, it's difficult to control just one thing. Because if you do, then the flow is going to sort of interfere with that. So, let's go in now and let's go and take control of some of the other things on the page. I'm going to put a width of 100% in here. I believe that's a browser Issue, compatibility issue with the older version of Firefox. So, if this is, let's see, there we go, now it goes all the way across. If this is starting at position 10 from the top, 20 from the left, then Maybe the navigation I want to put over here. And maybe, and I'm just going to rough this out and guess, maybe that will be something like 50 from the top, 20 from the left. So I'm going to go and I'm going to change the navigation to be from the top, 
20 from the left, position absolute, and I'm going to give it a smaller width. I'm going to give it a narrower width. In fact, I'll give this a width instead of percentage. I'll give this a width of 800 pixels. I'll give this a width of... 200 pixels. Now, we're still going to have a bit of a mess, right? Because I haven't done anything with the section yet. But we'll see that in a second. So I go and save that and refresh. Alright. Couple things wrong. 50 is too low. I need to push it down a little bit further. So let's make it like 150. All right, so now the banner's up here, the navigation's over here, and the only thing that gets in the way is this guy because we haven't done any position. So we haven't done any position, so what does the browser say? Well, I'm just going to start, all those guys that we're not giving a position to, I'm just going to start flowing them from the top of the page on down. So, well, that's clearly not good because this interferes with that now. All right. Now notice that I didn't assign a height here. So again, what is the height? The height is what the browser decides to make the height based on all the other properties that we do give. So lastly, to position this content area, let's say I want the content area over here. And I'm going to guess and say I want it to be 150 from the left and 150 from the top. Now we could probably sit down before we're doing this and, and plan everything out and, and all that, but I'm just sort of letting it evolve. And if it's not right, we'll, we'll fix it. All right. I'm also going to give a width uh, uh, to this to, to make it um, sort of match the other things. So let's go into the CSS now. I'm going to close the HTML because we really don't need that anymore. And I'm going to go and I'll give this guy a width of 650 pixels, let's say. And I'll give it a position of a left of, let's see, a top of 150, I said, and a left of 150. You're paying attention, whoever said that. All right. So 150 wasn't right, which makes sense now because I made the width of that guy 200. So let's try 250. There we go. And alas, we have a layout that matches the wireframe that we had originally drawn. All right. Remember, the wireframe we just sort of sketched out that it would look a certain way and, and, and so on. All right. Now notice again that we could fiddle with it if we wanted, for example, this to match the width of that. Looks like we're maybe 50 pixels off on that. So I could go in probably and make this 850. Not quite. And why don't these things add up numerically? Well, because there's padding and all that in there. So you're going to be a little off with that. You could take the time to calculate it, or you could do like me and just sort of fudge it till it works. There we go. All right. Now that matches that. Now notice that it doesn't matter how big the screen is, right? So if someone had a small monitor, maybe, and their screen looked like that, they'd have to scroll horizontally and vertically. If you viewed this on a mobile device that had a very small window, you'd have to scroll back and forth like that. So there's disadvantages to this approach, all right? And those are the big disadvantages uh, of it. But the advantage of it is it's pretty simple. 
It's also, uh, another advantage of this is if you have a very specific, precise layout that you want to look exactly the same across all devices, uh, then this might be approach. Now, I should practice what I preach here and also view this page in Internet Explorer. All right. Essentially looks the same. Well, the reason that it's moving, I think, is just the address bar. In there's a little more space up here. Yeah, I guess so. The, the default height is a little different. And we can look at it even in Google Chrome because we have it. And it looks like that. Yes? When a website has maps to print the page, are they working off of a fixed template that forces it to a printer fast friendly format? Probably, yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, that is, that is, if it looks different when you go to print the page, then you know, because some web pages, when you print the page, it just looks like the page, right? But, but good, you know, someone that's been been thorough in their design, when you go to print it, it'll be formatted to look good on a printer. Like what I'm thinking, like is Google Maps, for example. Like you can view the directions, but then you can get a printer printer friendly version, and it gets rid of like some of the extraneous things and all that. But yeah, it would be a format uh, for that. We'll, we'll talk about that, um, I'm not sure when, uh, but we'll talk about, that is uh, uh, choosing a, a style sheet based on media. In other words, the screen looks one way, to the printer it's going to look a different way. All right, so again, not necessarily elegant, but we can start doing things like putting background images on, on uh, the page and putting some color and maybe putting some padding and all that. We could get this starting to look a lot more like uh, a real completed web page. All right. As someone noticed, the height of this is a little different on both. The height of the header. At, that, at this point, you have to do one of two things in my mind. Either you have to like figure out why and try to come up with a fix that works across both browsers, or you look at it and say, you know, that really doesn't matter that much. All right, um, and, and that sounds like that's like a cop out, or that's taking the the the, uh, the the lazy approach. But in web development, it it isn't at all. Right? Um, I think sometimes people go to extraordinary lengths to make pages look identical across platforms when that's just browsers being browsers, right? And as long as it's legible, as long as it makes sense and it's workable and all that, I guess I'm not going to panic too much if the page looks slightly different between, uh, between things. You know, I've had students come up to me in a panic saying that, oh, it doesn't look the same in IE as in Firefox. And they'll show me and I'm like, where's that again? Where? Oh, that? You know, like you think I would have noticed that, you know. Uh, and again, you know, that, that's, that's uh, to be sure, uh, you know, a good quality to be very diligent in and, and, uh, and, and trying to do that. But I think uh, people have to realize that the web is sort of a different medium than other graphic design, you know. With other graphic design, if you're printing a magazine, you have control over that, how that magazine is going to look, right? I got this magazine here, right? This is only going to be this size of paper, <laughs> right? It's not like they have to make it work differently because I'm going to have a magazine this size, you're going to have a magazine that size, right? Uh, and therefore, people that came from, a, especially people that come from a graphic design background, they get into web development, sometimes have that mindset, like, oh, it has to look perfect, it has to look exactly how I laid it out. And I guess what I'm saying is that's not even necessarily a good thing in web development. Especially when we talk about some of the more flexible layouts. It's going to look different on a mobile device, but that's good. Because a mobile device is different than a big old screen. All right. So I guess what I'm saying is you can look at these browser compatibility issues. It's okay to say, you know what, it's a little different, but 
I don't really care. All right? And this one, I definitely would not worry about that particular difference. Okay, why would we use the aside command over here to, to move the navigation over to the left and export that? The, uh, I'm not sure exactly what you're asking, but the aside has nothing to do with the positioning of it. Oh. The aside means that it is sort of a, uh, a tangent off the main topic of the page, or off the main article. So it doesn't really relate to the way it's, it's positioned. All the positioning is going to be done through CSS. Yes? So if you wanted two columns, would you just make a class for the section to call one section down the center and then the other section all the way? Well, if I want to make two columns, let, let, let's go and do that because that, that's a great question. Let me put, let me put, let me break this down into two sections. All right, and we're going to run into some problems. I say that so you don't think I'm losing it, you know, when we, when we do run into problems. All right, and that problem is those two things are right on top of each other. Why are they right on top of each other? Well, because we have a style rule that says every section is going to start 150 from the top and 250 from the side. And that was okay when we only had one section, right, because it put that section there. Now that ain't going to cut it. So the question is, is if we want to make two columns, what could we do? And again, this is one of those things that could go a bunch of different ways. Here's the way that I would approach it. I would do something like this. I would go into my HTML and I'd give this guy an ID of say column one or part one. I like that better because column one implies that it's always going to be displayed as two separate columns. It might not be. I'll then give this guy an idea of part two. I'll go and change the style rule to say part one. I want a width of, of, of 650. Let's say I want a width of 300. And I don't want it, and that part I'm going to leave the same now. I'll then go and put a different style rule for part two. And I will say also a width of 300, except I don't want it to start 250 from the left. I want it to start, say, 575. Whoa. I forgot to save the other notepad file. Yeah, I don't think that's causing me grief, but it is wrong. So I'll go and fix it. All right. So that's, that's how we, we have it now. So we have the two columns. Now, this is where style-wise, um, the author of the textbook would say, you're probably better off doing some of these things in a class, right? Because if you look at my style rule, an awful lot of this is duplicated, all right? But part of it isn't duplicated, right? Because part of it has a different, uh, different value for it. So what I could do is I could do something like this. I could make a style rule 
for any part, anything that I define as part of the page. Actually, I could make it for any section, right? But I'll do it with a class just to demonstrate that. And then I could say that part one has a class equal to part part two has a class of part and the page should look the same and it does assuming I've saved everything So there I used a mix of ID. I use the ID for the things that's distinct to just that one thing, and I use the class to say all my parts, the way uh, the, the attributes I want true for all my parts. That way if I come down and I say that all my parts, I want to have a background of yellow, I can only make that change in one place. If you are a lazy person, software slash web development is a perfect career for you. All right? Because if you can think of things that is going to save you some work, you're actually doing a great job. All right? In most other jobs, you think of things to save your work, you know, it's like, come on, man, you know, do what you need to do. Here you're actually rewarded for like, hey, I figured out a way so if they decide to change the color, I only have to do half as much work. It's like, good for you. You're doing a great job. So, uh, again, always try to think in terms of uh, what it will take to change something if something comes along. And generally speaking, if there's two solutions, if one of them is easier to change than the other, the one that's easier to change is probably the better solution. So you Well, I, I put I put the the background yellow on the with the class of part, right? Yeah, and therefore, when I look at the these, I, I gave an ID and the class to it, which is legal. It's also legal to put multiple classes on something. You can only have one ID because again, that that's what uniquely identifies it. Now, what I like to do now is I'm going to save this, save everything. And I'm going to make a, a second version of this, much like you've done with your labs. I, I hope as you, you, have, you have several of these assignments where you have to make two versions of the thing. My hope is that with each assignment, the two versions look more and more different as we learn more stuff with CSS. So I'm going to go and I'm going to copy this and make a second version of it. And it'll be the same, uh, same HTML with the only difference being that it's pointing to a different CSS. Now, let's say I decide I want a different look for this page. That I don't want the wireframe to look like this that I want the wireframe, well now it looks like this, with two columns. Let's say instead, I want the wireframe to look like this. Banner on the top, navigation here, column one, or part one rather, part two. So I want it to be aligned something like that, all right? Now, if we've done good, if we've done a good job, we should be able to get that without having to change our HTML. All right? So let's see in our remaining 10 minutes if we can accomplish that change. Um, let's go into the CSS and...
I'm going to start out by making the width of everything the same. Right? Because I want them all to be even. So I'll make the width of all of them to be 600 pixels, let's say. Zero. That would be interesting, right? All right. Uh, then I'm going to go, and again, I'll give this guy a top left of 10. All the lefts I want, or all the, yeah, all the lefts I want to be 10, right? Because I want it all to be lined up. And then the top I just am going to vary. So I'll make the top of this one 10, 150 for this one. Let's say... Three hundred for this one, and let's say oh, those are my lefts. Thank you. Three hundred, and let's make this one six hundred. What am I doing today? All right, let's save this, and let's view this. All right. Not exactly right, but we're, we're moving in the right direction, yeah. And again, with a few tweaks, this one could come up a little bit. But we got one kind of big problem, right? I don't like that navigation bar extending vertically. I'd rather have the links go horizontally. If we're going to do this layout, if you look at the manner in which I sketched it, it's sort of implied that my links are going horizontally. All right? But... If we look at this, we'll see that my links are in a UL, an unordered list. And the LI is a block tag, which means that one, they get stacked on top of each other. All right? So, you may be tempted to say, well, I guess it can't be in a UL then. All right, let me take that out and let me change the HTML. Wrong answer. You know, the buzzers go off, the sirens go off, and all that, right? Because if, if what I've been saying all along about CSS is true, whether the links are stacked horizontally or vertically is strictly a matter of appearance. It's not a different link if it's horizontal versus vertical, all right? So that's only the appearance of the link. So I should be able to make this change without changing the HTML and only doing CSS. Well, how do I do that? All right. You can do that by saying I can make that display as an inline tag. So let's break this statement down. All right. Nav li. What does that mean? That means in my nav section, any li, I don't want to treat like a block item. I want to treat it like an inline item. And what's an inline element? An inline element is one that goes horizontally as opposed to vertically. So the selector says nav li, and what that's saying is any li any li that's in the nav section, I want to treat this way. So let's go and save this. And... And look. And sure enough, now the links are going horizontal, which is the way I want them to. So we were able to change even that um, aspect of the HTML's appearance. All right. CSS is very flexible with that. And now you can know we could probably bump up some of these things and all that. Um, I won't do that. Just you know, just in the interest of time, but it would be pretty clear that we could we could tighten this up to put those things closer together, simply by going in and, and adding that. So now we have two pages 
with identical HTML except for pointing to a different style sheet that have two totally different layouts. One is laid out in sort of a three column layout, one is laid out as a one column layout. It's great when you can do that. You can do that first of all by keeping a very clean separation between the content and the way it looks. So again, no break tags, no horizontal rule tags, none of that stuff. Because that stuff is only appearance and therefore it doesn't belong in HTML. By doing it in CSS then, we have the ability to do this. So we can make a print version of the page that looks different, you know. We can make a, uh, you know, a, a mobile version of the page that looks different by only swapping out the style sheet file. All right. There's more to this, obviously, and, and we'll review this and I'll review any questions that you have. Um, and we'll continue with layout next time. Any questions, by the way? All right.